I'm an academic by training, but we spend a bunch of time both in the lab and outside of the lab at this intersection of you know, what's capable with AI and ML and, and what's needed in real world use cases. And especially in an event like this with so much exuberance and excitement around AI, um, I want to take some time today to kind of reflect on what we've seen in terms of um, what works and some of the challenges involved in adopting uh, AI and ML in the enterprise. Kind of a pragmatic view that mixes both uh, academic research um, and practical uh, applied applications of, of ML. So a little bit about me before we jump in. I'm on the faculty at Stanford um, and also the CEO and founder of a startup uh, called Sisu Data. Um, some of the background for this talk uh, came from a lab that I started at Stanford with a bunch of great colleagues, um, basically in 2016 to research and build systems for usable ML. Basically asking this question, uh, instead of trying to make ML models more and more accurate, right, like getting better and better scores on ImageNet or CIFAR, or, uh, language modeling tasks, you know, what can we do to actually make these technologies more applicable and easier and more accessible by domain experts who know a lot about their field but may not have you know, the teams of PhDs required to get a success like AlphaGo um, off of the ground. And um, perhaps surprisingly, we found that even within some of uh, these really cutting edge AI ML adopters, um, you really only get the AI ML magic on a small number of teams. Like you're optimizing click-through rate, you get a lot of PhDs. You're looking at account management, not so lucky, right? So, um, so it, was, it was a really great um, experience and really formed a lot of um, interesting systems and, and research at this intersection of really you know, new computational primitives. So in some sense, you think about the enterprise IT stack, we've optimized the heck out of relational primitives and SQL and data warehousing, and now there's this brand new class of workloads at scale, which is these ML operators, um, applying this to very large amounts of data at scale and then making it useful to people. So a little bit of background there, and, and, and I think you know, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone in this room or watching this talk that you know, it's, in some sense it's kind of a golden era for data and ML, right? We wouldn't be here, this wouldn't be a packed conference um, if there weren't these kind of incredible advances in image recognition, NLP, planning, and it seems like you know, basically about every week there's a new article uh, in the news about just how AI ML is really getting integrated into every product and changing the way we think about working with data. So, a lot of exuberance, very well deserved on one side, but at the same time, especially when you go out, you know, and look at where AI ML is being adopted in, you know, everyday enterprise use cases and applications, there's sort of this feeling where, like, we're not quite there yet, right? If you look at um, some of the larger and more public um, efforts in AI ML, they have yet to kind of pay off uh, in a big way, and what we see is a lot of kind of consulting oriented. A high customer acquisition cost and bespoke integration oriented solutions where, yes, if you hire your own team of you know, PhDs in ML and AI, you can actually get access to some of this technology, but the kind of you know, second coming of, of, of data in the form of, you, know, you get an AI, you get an AI, you get an AI, um, and, 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 and um, kind of replicable platforms has yet to kind of materialize. And so, starting on the sort of uh, down note, I wanted to reflect a little bit on why, we, why I think adoption or some of the hype has not lived up to reality in the form of what I call you know, three inconvenient truths about making ML usable and useful uh, for practical applications. So first inconvenient truth we'll start with is that you know, to make this stuff work, uh, it's no, no secret that AI ML, especially in the form of deep learning, you know, requires a lot of training data. Right, a lot of labeled uh, images, either labeled by humans or labeled by um, you know, for sources of weak supervision. And you know, what I've shown here is the ImageNet data set, which is essentially 14 million label images and $300,000 worth of Mechanical Turk. Now, it turns out this is probably the best spend. If you think about all the investment going into AI and ML, this 300K probably went further than any other 300K <laughs> that, that, we, that we've seen deployed in public or private markets towards AI ML. Um, and as a result of this ImageNet data set, it really led to the, to the resurgence of the interest in, in deep learning, right? 2012, we had models um, coming out that just obliterated prior approaches in image processing. You went from hand-tuned features to these ones that were learned. You saw the same thing happen with NLP. The challenge, of course, is that when we're actually looking at applying ML in practice, getting this training data can actually be kind of hard. So, you know, if I want to label or make predictions using input data that's relatively well formed like this picture here, right? I've got a very clearly defined dog, a very clearly defined bicycle, a very clearly defined car. I can get a lot of data that looks like this. And in fact, a lot of the training data 
in these large publicly labeled data sets looks a lot like this. But as soon as I start looking at realistic tasks, right, I sort of get a little bit out of the, out of the norm. I start to see, you know, pictures looking like this, right, where I've got, you know, this dog on the floor with a, with a, with a uh, stuffed animal. We get the stuffed animal right, but I can assure you um, that unless you have very extreme animal rights tendencies that this person is not, or this is not a person on the ground, right? This is, this is very clearly a dog. Um, and this gets even worse as we go outside of that sort of canonical corpus of training data. So another example here, we have a variable resistor, and we're seeing an AI toy, a person, and a vehicle auto part. Okay, clearly not getting this thing right. Um, one of my favorite examples, just to, just to wrap up the round, you know, um, this is very clearly the Queen of England and not a shower cap. Although, <laughs> one might imagine with such you know, beautiful locks of hair that there were some shower caps that look like this in the training data set. And so for these types of realistic tasks, we can't just take these off the shelf models and expect they're going to work. Moreover, for a lot of the most high value tasks where we aspire to apply ML, the data is often very sensitive. So we can't necessarily get um, mechanical turkers to go look at a bunch of uh, CT scans and x-rays, right? First of all, it's hard to get the skilled professionals to do this labeling. And second of all, I certainly don't want my you know, x-rays being sent over you know, the public internet to Turkers um, who may or may not know what they're looking for. And this is not just true for medicine, which is where we get a lot of attention, but you start thinking about you know, fraud use cases or internal customer support tickets that you might have inside of your businesses, right? The, some of the most valuable, from a financial perspective, use cases of AIML are certainly not going to be ones you're going to put on, you know, the internet for a class of, of workers you'll, you know, may never meet, may never be able to verify, so on. People are certainly working on this task, but it's, it's a lot harder than saying, let's download a bunch of images from Flickr, hire grad students to label them, and then call it uh, a day. And the final um, thing I just want to highlight, and this is something that's really interesting in the research literature, is there have been these interesting set of studies. Google had one, Baidu had one. Basically looking at, you know, when do deep nets stop getting better? So if we add more and more training data, what happens? And you get this very funny curve. This is from a paper that Google released, um, I think about a year ago, uh, showing that if you increase the amount of training data here, the amount of label examples, like way, 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 way beyond what you get from an academic data set or what's publicly available, going out to 300 million uh, labeled images, the deep networks keep learning. And there's a funny effect where as you add exponentially more data, your models get linearly better. So uh, basically you have this, this leveling off. But it says if you want to get best in class uh, uh, quality, model quality, you better have a ton of data. And in fact, if you know, epsilon, say 0.0001% accuracy is a differentiator in your market, because you're dealing with something like fraud, or dealing with something like medical um, uh, diagnoses, where the cost of getting something wrong is a big deal, Suddenly, actually investing in this training data goes from um, a, a kind of exercise in getting ML to work to something that you know, is going to be very hard to compete on. And once you have a head start, you, know, you can continue to, to double down on that over time. And so it's going to be very, one corollary to this, very briefly, is it's going to be hard for any one AI ML company to win every single vertical because of this type of effect. And for these high value tasks, they're just data hungry, data hungry, data hungry. You see in this plot, you know, you're getting these like, this is a log scale, so it's really starting to taper off in terms of the curve, but hasn't capped out yet. You can throw probably you know, three billion images at this data set and still see quality improvements. Sorry, that was just the first inconvenient truth. Uh, <laughs> we got a few more coming, but in many valuable tasks, right, the ones where like eyes light up or investors' dollar signs are you know, popping out of their heads, like there's not that much training data, and it's very scarce for these valuable tasks. We're not just gonna download an existing model and fine tune it and call it a day. Second inconvenient truth is that in most enterprises, a large fraction of the data today is structured, right? This lives in transaction level databases, customer data platforms. We've seen the rise like up and up and up of these cloud warehouses, things like Snowflake and Redshift and BigQuery. Right? There's more and more data available in basically tables, right? tabular form. Super boring stuff, no one likes talking about tables anymore, we call them data frames, but really, tables are pretty common. It's where a lot of transaction level detail, customer interactions, um, financial records, it all lives inside of tables. And most of the most valuable data in enterprises lives in this structured form. Today, about two thirds of this data, depending on how you ask and which, which data vendor you're talking to, goes, goes unutilized, right? 
but it's sitting there. And so you might imagine, okay, AI ML is getting way better. I'm so excited. I hear about the latest deep nets. We're going to throw deep networks at all this structured data. Life is good. Um, the problem is deep networks don't help that much with structured data. Right? The advances we're seeing in images and natural language processing and having robots play Atari, right? these, are, these look a lot different than analytics on top of tables. Um, one of my favorite examples of this, just to pick on um, some friends, um, there is a paper, big splash out of Google, scalable and accurate deep learning with electronic health records. Has anyone seen this paper or heard about this in the news? Okay, a few of you, yeah. Um, made a big splash. Um, so they show, you know, for predicting things like inpatient mortality, so like is someone going to die, or 30-day readmission, is someone going to come back to the hospital? They get pretty good accuracy. It's like it's pretty amazing to predict inpatient mortality with 95%. Um, I hope if I get like a true for that model that I'm one of the 5% that's wrong, but like that's a pretty good number, right? I have no idea how it stacks up to, to doctors, but this is why it got into the Nature Journal. Funny thing though, a few days after this paper came out, uh, someone pointed out on Twitter um, that if you look in the appendix, like, like not in the main paper, but like three pages into the supplementary material, if you take the simplest model that you teach in kind of ML 101, so log logistic regression, you can kind of, you can run a version of this based in Excel, okay? Um, logistic regression compared to these deep nets gets almost the same accuracy, right? So 93 versus 95, 75 versus 77, um, Really impressive to get this, this, this bump in accuracy, but again, like the value here, so much of it comes from just getting the data, cleaning it up, getting it in the right format, and then applying any model to this thing. And the funny thing about this logistic regression model, if you're a stats nerd like me, is if you add some really simple, like nonlinear model, say you throw XGBoost or gradient boosted tree at this, they never did this, but you know, there's a good chance it would re actually recover that gap. Um, so, Long story short, like for these deep net or for these tabular data sets and what lives inside of your database and what's inside of Snowflake and everything you probably spent your time on and your data transformation going into your data lake, deep networks are not going to be suddenly, you know, second coming of uh, of 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 of, of um, whatever data you subscribe to. Um, so, so enterprise data is structured, but deep networks aren't designed for that. They're designed for data that's like messy and unstructured and, and is text or images. And it's like, I can't describe what a chair looks like, right? Like a chair has four legs, except this chair has one leg, right? Um, but if I have things like this customer churned, it's like true, false, yes, this person did not buy again, right? So it's, you, you, the deep networks don't have the same expressive power. Um, okay, so number two. Yeah, structured data is ubiquitous, not very helpful with deep networks. Um, number three is, is, and I think this is really fun actually coming to this venue and seeing this, um, with the convenience of like modern software we come to expect, right? Many of you probably have, you know, IT organizations, engineering organizations that ship software. You expect there to be like testing, quality assurance. You have uh, people doing um, customer service and basically, you know, you have a, hopefully a feedback loop where you're testing your software before you ship it out. Um, turns out in ML, a lot of the conveniences like con continuous integration, continuous deployment, they're basically in their infancy. Um, this is a paper from Google. Again, Google kind of like lives in the future, so it's fun to see what they write about and then be like, like oh my God, here's how far we have to go. Um, so, so for this paper, Hidden Technical Debt Machine Learning Systems, they make this really great point, and this is one of their figures. It's, you know, only a small fraction of real world ML systems are actually composed of ML code. Right, like you don't need a better deep network in many cases to make ML work. You need to figure out like what data do we have? How do we label it? How do we train this? How do we deploy it? How do we monitor it? How do we make sure it's not making mistakes? And so on. There's a bunch of really great companies, like as a result of this problem, there's a bunch of great companies, there's a bunch of people exhibiting. I'm not selling my company, this is not my, <laughs> not, not, not what we do, but like there's a bunch of people working on this problem that are really interesting. But if you wanna say, go to the races with AI ML, there's a lot of challenges in doing this. And, and, and you know, not to take it from me, right, seems like uh, there's a lot of like punching bags for, um, for people screwing up in, in public with ML. You, you had Tay, the racist chatbot for Microsoft. Um, you have the test, like Tesla continues to have problems with their autopilot system. It's just like really, really hard to verify that a deep network is actually doing the right thing. That it's like, it's an open problem. You probably wouldn't, like the guys who won the Turing Award this year got the Turing Award for um, basically popularizing deep nets today. Uh, you'd probably get another Turing Award if you could certify that a deep net would do the right thing. Okay, like that, that's how hard this problem is. Um, and it's not just that the models themselves can get kind of wonky, but there's also like problems in the fundamental data infrastructure. So there's an amazing paper um, at a new venue, um, 
that, that started this past year called SysML, where Google wrote about how their production model serving system um, actually validates that the inputs are correct, right? So this is like the best engineering organization on the planet talking about their issues and their strategies for making sure that you feed in the right data into models. And even at Google scale, there's like, you know, crazy number of errors of a 30-day period for things that can go wrong with the models that they were serving. Like someone added a new feature or to add another column to the input data that wasn't present at training time. Therefore, when you, you know, run your giant you know, matrix multiply or your vector vector multiply, like who knows what happens, right? Or you shift all the features, features over by one. It's like, that's like a like, big deal, right? Um, and you know, missing features, uh, there's too many examples in a data set, so you can, it's too small. So it's very, very hard today without a ton of essentially you know, manual oversight, for lack of a better term, um, to actually deploy these models with confidence and say, okay, great, you know, I fired up PyTorch, I hired my data science team, I got some PhDs, we're shipping models, we're gonna go like, let these things run and then, and then move on to the next thing, right? It's, it's a continuous process because we're lacking so many of the fundamental abstractions that are present in modern software development, right? Um, when's the last time you got in your car and wondered, you know, is my brake system going to work? Hopefully not very, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it hasn't happened to anyone. But you know, when you step into, say, a, a level four, level five autonomous vehicle, right, these are questions that are naturally going to come up. And, and autonomous vehicles are super challenging space, right? There's a bunch of really smart people working on it, but when we think about enterprise AI and ML, you have a similar set of challenges, just much less public. And in many cases, uh, topics that don't get the same level of scrutiny and attention in a research context, and as a result, are really kind of like you know, being here, for example, getting involved in this community, like you're, you're a pioneer, right? Um, which is both awesome and kind of scary. Um, <laughs> so these are three of the inconvenient truths we've realized, you know, working with some of the most sophisticated organizations and, you know, reading a lot of um, uh, uh, papers in the space, public and some ourselves. And I think, you know, rather than just having this be a complete wet blanket of a talk and kind of trying to bring some um, uh, level-headedness to the game, there is a bit of a silver lining here and that there are some strategies we found for effectively mitigating some of these challenges in deploying actual production AI ML products, right? Um, and this kind of essentially comes down to understanding what's possible and understanding, hey, given the organizational processes that are in place in the modern enterprise, how do we fit ML AI and data products into those processes as opposed to trying to completely replace them? So, the positive part of the talk, you know, uplifting. Uh, three strategies to effectively utilize ML and looking at, you know, making ML useful. So, and these will parallel our three um, uh, sort of inconvenient truths as well. So, you know, first inconvenient truth, if you remember, was it requires a lot of training data in order to uh, make models work, right? And that's a real pain. You either have to, you know, hire a bunch of folks to basically go and label this for you, or there's a bunch of servers that will do this, but it's gonna be expensive and scales often linearly with the number of data points that you need. And as we know, these models keep getting more and more and more and more uh, data points and keep getting better and better. So one strategy we found that's actually pretty helpful is, is, is looking at the data available inside of a modern enterprise. There's actually a lot of data that's already present, right? A lot of AI ML initiatives say, great, we're gonna go, you know, work on, um, detecting which customers are gonna churn. And therefore we gotta go figure out, okay, you know, what other data should we go get? Should we go pull some new customers? Should we go buy some model off the shelf? Should we go and enrich this da data, so on? It's like, in many cases, sitting inside of your, you know, data lake, data warehouse, all these different transactional databases that, that exist across different lines of business, there's a lot of data that can already be utilized. These are large data sets. They're often already labeled Right? If you have a bunch of, say, customer satisfaction scores sitting you know, on a hard drive somewhere, that's actually a great source of training data where you can start to actually apply AIML on top of this data as opposed to having to um, go get a bunch, new, a bunch of new labels. And some of the work we've been doing um, following, uh, coming out of the Dawn project, there's a really cool project uh, called Snorkel. And the idea here uh, at a high level, recently deployed this at Google, had a great blog post out in, in, in March, since you look at this problem, we're at Google, they have, I don't know how many zeros worth of clicks of data every day about what people care about looking at on the web. In terms of understanding which impressions were good or not, obviously there's did you click or not, 
but there's a huge number of ad campaigns, there's a huge number of possible sources of data that no one, you know, you could probably never serve, right? It's this data that exists, like it's stored on a hard, hard drive somewhere, but you would never hire enough people to be able to go and manually label, yes, this was a good impression for this given user, or yes, this is a good, is a good campaign for a given type of um, interest, for example. Uh, but what they realized is that by essentially taking the rules and by learning from, say, several years worth of manual labeling for a small set of data, they could extract general heuristics and patterns that could apply to all of these you know, terabytes, petabytes worth of data to extract label training data. So I'll give you a, a, an analog without going too much into this use case. Um, if you wanted to look for which disease drug interactions exist in the medical literature, you know, if you read the sentence, smoking causes cancer, it's kind of common sense for everyone here, hopefully, um, uh, then you could vary, you, you, so if you read the sentence, smoking causes cancer, you could extract a label that says smoking and cancer are related, right? Okay, you read another and you say like, um, drinking tea causes jitteriness. Okay, great, you've got that. Um, you, could, you could imagine reading all of the device, or the medical literature, extracting all these different facts one by one by one, or you could realize, hey, you know what we're actually doing? We're reading the text for X causes Y. Let's write a regular expression, and when I see X and Y together, I'll pull that out and I'll label it as a relationship. Now, I might get it wrong some of the time, might have a sentence that says, it's well known, it's false, that avocados cause cancer. Hopefully that's the case, right? <laughs> um, but for the most part, that label is going to be right, and the deep learning model can start to learn to generalize. And so this is an example where, in the case, by applying this both to medical literature with collaborators in the med school, but also even in like, you know, one of the most sophisticated uh, ML orgs in the, on the planet, which is Google Ads, you can afford to label tons of data that was present without actually having to hire a large team of people to do it. All right, second strategy here, moving right along. Um, I think a lot of the rhetoric around AI and ML is around, you know, we're gonna automate everything, right? You have this, this dream where you, know, you show up to the office, there's a bunch of unplugged cords, there's no desks left, you're like, where'd everyone go? It's, it's in the cloud, right? We got the AI in the cloud. Um, the reality is, you know, when we think about enterprise AI ML in that way, we're sort of turning our backs on the last 25 years of AI ML actually working for us, which is in the consumer space, right? I always love thinking about consumer tech as an example where AI ML actually works. Like things like Google search and Netflix movie recommendations and Amazon uh, product recommendations and for better or worse, the Facebook news feed, right? And in all these scenarios, the theme is not that, I should illustrate that, you know, I would love if when I searched last night for, you know, prep for my O'Reilly talk, Google like generated these slides for me, right? There may be someone upstairs with a vendor booth talking about generating slides from, from, a, from an outline. That would be, I will pay for that. If someone's selling that, please find me after the talk. Um, unfortunately, right, when I get back from Google is it tells me about O'Reilly conferences. So you can speak at an O'Reilly conference. You can propose, pr propose, pr prepare, present. Great, that's actually, that's actually what I did. So I did that, which is helpful, but it didn't make my slides for me, okay? Even if I get more granular, like, I, I, I know this is like super obvious, but I'm making, making a point here, right? If I get super granular, I'm like, hey, just prep breakfast, you know, book me an Uber, queue up a playlist, get pumped up on the way down. Like, Google can't even do that for me. Right? It's not that hard, I eat the same thing for breakfast every morning. They know where I need to go, it's on my calendar, and you know, I, Spotify already chooses what I listen to, right? But again, like the, the fundamental like, degree of sophistication in which Google integrates my everyday workflows is not that sophisticated, right? I don't have, there's if this then that, but what, what Google, right, probably the number one, certainly money making and arguably one of the most useful data products on the planet is really just an index, right? It's recommending things for me to do. And so when we think about, for instance, building a churn predictor or automating a marketing campaign or um, getting rid of, say, you know, a uh, uh, customer service function that's very expensive, right? Instead of actually expecting that the AI ML is gonna come and do everything for us, I think that this idea of a recommend recommendation and putting a human in the loop and augmenting that human's intuition with, you know, essentially intelligent search and recommendation on top of large amounts of data, that's much closer to what we can do today than, than at least where I would love us to be, you know, where I see a lot of the, the excitement around enterprise AI ML heading. And this is still really useful. Right, like if I didn't have Google, I would probably still be in San Francisco because I wouldn't know, you know, how to get here. Right, and actually, I, I use Google probably three times trying to figure out, you know, which room we're in and um, and, and where should I show up. 
Third, third, third opportunity as well ties into the previous one is instead of expecting our AI ML to be like amazing out of the gate, like I, 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 I download the latest text model, I fine tune on my data set and it's awesome and I'm like just gonna let it go wild and it's, gonna, it's not gonna be like Tay at all. It's gonna, like they, we learned, okay? Um, there's this idea where we can start with something that's good enough and iterate, right? So, so one of the funny things about AI ML development is that it actually can get better over time. You can incrementally retrain like with traditional software development, right, it gets better when you're like, okay, great, we're gonna spec out this next release, we're gonna go build it, we're gonna go test it, we're gonna go ship it, or I'll upgrade the library, right? Like AIML can get better over time. And again, thinking back to consumer space, right, which is where a lot of this has actually seen adoption, you know, think about an interaction like, like Pandora, right? When I tell Pandora, hey, play, play Vampire Weekend or play, play um, a station for me, I don't expect it to be like, you know, Elton John being my personal DJ. Right? I actually, and in fact, encoded in here, there's, the, um, there's these implicit cues in the interface to say, you know, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like. And in many cases, you don't have to say, like, it's actually kind of funny, I was, when I make the talk, I try to find instances of, was this result helpful to you? Sometimes, I'm sure you've seen those dialogues before, but actually what we've seen increasingly is people just say, whatever you do, whatever you spend time on, where your eyeballs are, what you click on, what you share, what you favorite, and so on, that's actually more signal about what you care about than anything else. And so, Rather than, again, shooting for having a model that works great out of the gate, shoot for one that just kind of works. Put people in front of it and use that feedback, either implicit or explicit, in order to get better and better and better. And so it's not all doom and gloom. And just to kind of, before we wrap, I want to give a quick example of, of one case study we had uh, in the Dawn project. It's an example of what these principles look like in practice. Okay. So the specific case study I wanted to handle was kind of helping our users understand some of the key drivers behind their business metrics. Um, concrete scenario here uh, is that you know, business metrics like say user engagement are always changing and you want to know why. So we worked really early on with a mobile, um, uh, mobile device startup or sorry, mobile application startup looking at tracking driver behavior. And I was like, who's driving using our app and who's not? And it gives you insurance discounts, really cool. Um, hard part with these guys is you know, they deploy on the Android ecosystem. So there's 25 different software releases, and there's uh, 24,000 different hardware device types. And so if they want to know when engagement dips, why it dipped, you know, if you actually go through and check every individual software release and every individual device type, you're spending some like seven days looking at all these different facts, right? Looking at all these different combinations. Um, and, you know, it turns out some weird combinations of, of, say, device type and OS actually cause some problem that you didn't know about and some fraction of your users, like, hate your application and, you know, um, maybe it maybe, maybe able to grow over time. And so so I, I call out this example because I think it's really interesting. It's a problem that many organizations face. We actually saw it across a bunch of use cases, Facebook, Microsoft, Google. Um, you know, everyone who looks at, like, a Tableau dashboard wants to know why. And the challenge today from a use case perspective for AI ML was, you know, you can, you can, you know, to solve this problem, you kind of do it yourself. Like you can go into your dashboard, slice and dice, figure out, maybe you find like the right combination out of the millions that exist. Uh, maybe you find, maybe you call your, you know, business analyst or data science team and they'll fire up a notebook and they'll go and do some magic and run some correlation and get you a logistic regressor and come back with a presentation. Uh, but we started to want to know, you know, how can we apply these types of techniques that we had learned in these principles to actually solve this problem more intelligently. Now, the wrong thing to do, just like the anti-pattern, <laughs> would be let's go hire a bunch of people on Mechanical Turk, let's go label a bunch of examples of this, and let's go um, say we're gonna have an analyst in a box. Right? We're gonna get rid of the analyst, it's just gonna be, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, an oracle that will tell you everything to know about your business metrics. Looking back at our principles again, use the data we already have, well, in many cases, many of these analysts trying to understand what's going on there in their uh, specific metrics, they already have a ton of data available in their structured data lakes, right? You know, they may only be looking at user engagement, but along with every session, they also have the device type, the location, the user ID, how long that user's been signed in, other actions that user's taken, uh, they have any kind of promotional codes that user's been doing. They have a lot of data that's just sitting there that otherwise is not being utilized. Remember, like, depending on who you ask, you know, two thirds of this data is never actually touched. So let's start touching all of it. Let's start using all these factors and throw them into a larger ML model to look at what's, what's happening. And again, rather than saying, okay, great, you know, we're gonna have, a, we're gonna have an oracle that's gonna tell you exactly what to do, right? This is gonna be like the, the, the analyst team on steroids, it's gonna run the user engagement group. Instead of automating that process, we're instead going to recommend factors 
that users should inspect. For example, you know, some coupon code in the loyalty program had a large impact on transaction size, or some given make and model, or some given uh, uh, region and uh, cohort of users is changing, right? This is a much more modest goal than completely automating that function, going to the root cause. If you get five of these with 60% accuracy, you're gonna get three things that someone might not have found on their own. And by shipping early and improving over time, again, treating these as recommendations as opposed to uh, decisions that we're gonna take on and remove the user uh, and remove the analyst agency, right? We can use analyst feedback to improve ranking over time. Right? If you click on a result that we show in a UI and you share it with a friend and they log in and they look at it and they spend five minutes looking at it and then drilling deeper, like that's a signal about what they care about. Right? It's not something you're used to doing inside of a modern dashboarding tool because the ex expectation is that's kind of a, whatever you ask for is what you get. But once you move to this recommendation-based model, we can actually you know, ship with some maybe uh, relatively coarse-grained models for what we think you care about and learn that over time and learn that within an organization. And so you know, there's a bunch of research here. I'd love to talk about it. I know we're running short on time. How do you do this with, at high scale with low latency? How do you do it in a way that's, interp uh, that's interpretable and so on? Um, we did some interesting deployments. Actually wrote a paper that was just uh, published two weeks ago with Microsoft, Facebook, and Google talking about some of our use cases um, with these guys. But you know, the net effect was we could kind of get this almost recommendation. Here's what we think are the biggest factors in this case, you know, influ influencing, say, spend on a mobile application. You know, females on morning and mobile are actually way more likely to spend. Now, would you have found that if you just looked at women or just looked at mobile or just looked at, uh, uh, at morning? Probably not. But again, you know, by essentially taking this intent from our user, here's what I care about, here's my business metric, taking all the data associated with that given user, right, all those other attributes attached to the data that are just sitting there in the data lake, right, you invest in this customer data platform, what do you do next, right? We were able to show that we could get, you know, in some cases, you know, faster time to why, um, using basically all of that data, right, without having to wonder, did I have a bias search and so on. We've since done a bunch of work, this is not a pitch, done a bunch of work productionizing some of the stuff um, at CSU, but I really just wanted to mention this um, in practice as an example of how using the data you already have lets you do a lot of interesting stuff. By almost lowering the bar from complete automation of business functions in this enterprise AI space and saying, how do I augment my existing domain experts understanding? How do I make them um, more efficient? And how do I take some of that rote, boring, common case, 80% um, of the effort work, and for the easy cases, let a machine do the work, super valuable, right? I, you know, give an example, right? With Google, I never go past the first page because it's basically good enough. But the first couple results, like, I might go scan through those. We can do the same thing with AI ML. And again, by setting the expectation that things are gonna be imperfect, but you put a human in the loop and you can learn from the human, you can actually get quite a bit of ways towards seeing success out of the gate and getting better and better over time, and getting to that goal where you initially set out, which is having this kind of transformative effect with AI and ML. So thank you for your time. Uh, really appreciate your attention.